Charlie Munger earlier today where, you know, they don't hide their disdain for the cryptocurrencies, as you say. He In this talk, he called it crypto crap. Um, yeah. But the, the line from his talk today that I want to bring up with you, which for me was more interesting than his, you know, hate on crypto, is when he said nothing has done more good to the human race than national currencies. So he's, he was talking and saying, you know, people who want to replace national currencies with things like cur cryptocurrencies, he thinks this is absolutely, absolutely idiotic. And it's almost like us wanting to, to replace our national air. So a true believer, he thinks that, you know, national currencies are the greatest thing ever. And I was wondering, what's Mike Maloney's thoughts and response to that? Well, you have to look at the way they're designed. You know, when we used gold as money, and one of the things, you know, the first chapter of the book is, the, the book covers a lot of things. The first thing is, uh, is gold, is real money versus national fiat currencies. There's no nation on the earth that uses money today. And people need to start differentiating between money, because money makes, currency takes. Uh, money is something that propels mankind forward. It's, a, it's, a, it's honest, it's fair. Uh, currency is dishonest, it's, it's fraud and it's theft. And when you look at the way currency is created, when we used money, when we used gold, uh, the amount of time and effort that it took to go out and prospect, find a claim, develop that into a mine, mine the ore, Mel, uh, refine the ore, melt it down, pour it into a bar, melt those bars and mint them into a coin, that amount of effort equaled the amount of effort that you had to work for in whatever you did to accumulate the right amount of coins of real money to be able to buy a house. And so this work was equal to the work that you had to put in, which is equal to the, the work that it took to uh, cut down all of the trees, dig up all the dirt to make the copper plumbing and the cement and things, and build that house. It was a fair trade of something for something. When you use fiat currency, it's conjured into existence by a bank. Uh, you know, when, when you're buying a house, you take a piece of collateral, you find a home that you want to buy. This is my collateral. I want to borrow a million dollars. The bank looks at your, uh, you know, your financial record and determines whether or not you're a good risk that you, if you can pay this loan back. And when they say yes, they imagine a million dollars worth of bank credit currency, which is reminders that they, it, it's not actual dollars in your account, at least according to the Bank of England. It's reminders that they owe you a certain number of IOUs. <laughs> But, but national currencies steal part of your future lifetime. This is my big point, is it, yeah. it's, it's a tool for enslavement. Just to have them around requires your future work hours to uh, pay on the assets that were acquired to create these IOUs. There's, there's in chapter four, it does explain that the entire currency system comes down to it's nothing but IOUs. And what is it that they owe us? They owe us part of our own future lifetimes. We have been monetized. It's an IOU, YOU, IOU, you. <laughs> I, on, on that, to that point, I want to bring up a, a section in your book, There's No Place Like Home, where you say, in the US, before the creation of our central bank, an average home cost a few thousand dollars. Um, you, you, you question, did the home go up or did the currency go down? But here's the, the part I really enjoyed. Before the Fed, the US dollar was worth 1 20th of an ounce of gold. Now I can't tell you what the exact price of gold is as I'm writing this, but if you take the current price of an ounce of gold and put one in front of it, you will have the fraction of an ounce of gold that the dollar is worth as you are reading this. Yes, you say, the US dollar is only worth one, insert the current price of gold, of an ounce of gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the free market exchange rate. That is what they've done to the dollar. They've stolen more than 97% uh, of the purchasing power of the dollar. And we are about to see gold make up. For, I mean, it's, it's lagging right now as far as it accounting for the expansion of the currency supply. And that is about to change, uh, I think, over the next uh, three years or so. You're going to see some dramatic shifts.
So I, that's what I want to talk about now. Why the dramatic shifts? When you say that you know something big is going to unfold or a crisis is coming, I want to understand what that looks like for you. What are you preparing for? Well, there's two things that uh, are going to trigger this. I mean, uh, the creation of currency during the pandemic, they increased the M2 currency supply by roughly 40%. Then they decide, oh, there's inflation, and they, they're like surprised. <laughs> they, they wonder where that came from. And so to try and get a hold of inflation, they're going to raise interest rates and make them positive, but they're raising them at the fastest rate in history. There's never been anything like this. Uh, when you're coming off of such a low interest rate of 0.25%, um, you know, uh, half a point is a 200, a half a point increase on 2.25% is uh, a 200% increase. And so, you know, you go on the Fed's website and you can generate uh, charts and you go year over year percentage change and it's like 8,000% increase. It's just totally insane, you know, since they started the rate hikes. Um, that has never been done before and it will end up breaking something sometime or another. Uh, when the mortgage, uh, when, when the 2008 global financial crisis happened, Alan Greenspan didn't see that, you know, when he was trying to, when he lowered interest rates to 1% after the NASDAQ crashed, he was trying to reflate the stock markets and he didn't even see the real estate bubble that he had accidentally created, you know, in his peripheral vision here. That was, that was like a side effect of those low interest rates, that and the development of mortgage-backed securities. So there wasn't enough um, watching. I, I don't like overregulation, but they need to watch for conflicts of interest. And there were a lot of conflicts of, of interest going on in the banking sector then. And, uh, and the repeal of Glass-Steagall and uh, Alan Greenspan lowering the rates and, and not seeing the bubble that he was creating that's, that all caused the global financial crisis. Well, look at what we're doing this time. We've never raised rates at this type of pace before. And the currency that has just been created just before we started raising rates is astronomical. And then you look at, you know, the, the national debt rolls over every five years, roughly. It's a little bit longer than five years now. But if you take the average duration of all the different bill, bills, notes, and bonds, and, uh, and it's $31 trillion worth of debt that we're rolling over, and we have to do basically a mortgage refinancing, you know, a refi on the entire uh, United States of America. We're refinancing the United States of America every five years, roughly. And so we're only like, uh, you know, we're less than a year into these higher interest rates. So it's really not taking its big bite out of the budget. But calculate, what are, what are we at, 4.6% interest right. now on, on the Fed funds rate? Uh, so take a calculator and, and find out what 4.6% uh, uh, interest is on $31 trillion. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty hefty chunk. All right. um, and uh, after five years, all of this goes to the higher interest rates. It, it's a death trap is what it is.